We have three verses to conclude in chapter 13 in our study of John. So John chapter 13, verses 36 through 38, and we'll finish up John chapter 13. Verse 36 reads, Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou cannot follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. And Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Let's pray. We'll pray silently together as is our custom. And then we'll get into these three verses. Father, we center our worship around the Word of God. And as we come now to the portion of our service where we preach the Word of God, uh, we ask for help to understand help to apply, uh, help to believe, and help us to glorify you through the preaching of the word. And may you use it to sanctify your saints and to convict sinners of their lost condition and save them for Christ's sake. In his name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Uh, many of us who teach the Bible find that uh, a lot of people are more interested in things that are kind of curious or controversial rather than just the straightforward message of God's word. An example of that is provided here by Simon Peter during what Jesus is, what's called Jesus' farewell discourse. He told the disciples he'd be leaving them soon. And because of this, he said to them in verse 34, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. That's the kind of biblical teaching. It's not extremely hard to understand, uh, but sometimes not valued maybe as much as we ought to. But Peter heard those words and, and he distracted Jesus and he returned to this mysterious issue of Jesus' soon departure. Instead of contemplating what Jesus had just said, he said in verse 36, Lord, whither thou goest thou? And so Peter's like a lot of us. We speculate on prophetic predictions. We quibble about whether the Lord's coming back mid-tribulation or pre-tribulation or, or whatever. And these things seem to be a little more exciting than just living a quiet biblical life, ordinary day after ordinary day, trying to be obedient to the commands of our Lord. So Peter's interruption happened at the moment that Jesus was trying to inform his disciples that he would what he was going to provide for them after his ascension into glory. But Peter wasn't ready to hear those words. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee? I will lay down my life for thy sake, he blurted out. But Peter needed to understand where Jesus was going and what Jesus was going to do for him, he needed to understand far more important things than what Peter would do for Jesus. Christians are, in fact, to follow Christ, but there's things that only Jesus can do. Uh, for instance, he's the only one that can die on the cross for sins. In addition, Jesus is certainly able to do his work without needing our help. In contrast, the demands that are put upon us simply in following Christ are more than we can do in our own strength. So to make this point clear to Peter, Jesus replied with a statement that is at the same time a prophecy, it's a rebuke, and it's also a ministry. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily I say unto you, The cock shall not crow until thou hast denied me thrice. No doubt, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John, who wrote these words, intended for us to think of Judas and Peter together 
as he wrote about the last events of Jesus' night with his disciples. And in doing this, we might be surprised to realize how much these two men have in common. Judas and Peter had both spent three years with Jesus, seeing his miracles and receiving some very privileged instructions. They both had received Christ's love and both have served him in return. Both men would fail Jesus in unspeakable ways in the hour of his greatest trial. We're told that Jesus was troubled in spirit over Judas' betrayal back in verse 21. And Peter's denials must surely have caused him maybe even greater pain. Uh, the similarity between Judas and Peter shows us that anyone can fall into temptation even when it comes to denying Christ. Peter, who kind of lists the is the head of the list of disciples could fall and deny Jesus. And if he can do that, any of us can. The lesson of Peter's failure was thus intended not simply for him, but all followers in Christ, including you and me today. If Peter had much in common with Judas, the differences between the two men are even more important. Most importantly, one of them was saved and one of them was not. Even though both of these men betrayed Jesus on the night of his arrest, Peter was ultimately restored by Jesus, whereas Judas received nothing but the woe that Jesus had prophesied in Luke 22, verse 22. When Judas faced uh, just how great his sin was, he didn't respond with repentance, but with suicide. And Peter, on the other hand, mourned, and he repented, and he was restored. So the differences between Judas and Peter are best seen, I think, in the motives behind their actions. Judas sinned with a, a treacherous heart, using piety as a cover for all of his evil intentions. Peter sinned with a boastful heart that was led into folly because of his real love for the Lord. And what a difference there is between true, a true disciple who lacks strength to live up to her, his or her faith, and a false disciple who has no faith at all, such as Judas. Ultimately, the faithless betrayer, having no saving relationship with Jesus, must face the bitter consequences of his sin by himself, as Judas did in taking his own life and then entering into an unforgiving, everlasting hell. In contrast, Peter, who belonged to the Lord, had a Savior who upheld him even in his sin and then rescued him after he had fallen. So, just as Peter shows that any of us can fall, he also shows us the necessity of each and every one of us having Jesus Christ as our Savior. Having learned from Peter that any of us can fall, we should next think about the steps that led to his fall. As often happens, his betrayal of Jesus took place suddenly. It's just out of nowhere. But as is usually the case, his quote-unquote sudden fall was really the result of things that had been brewing in his heart all along. This scenario is what we often find when believers fall into gross sin. We think, for instance, of King David, who looked out his palace window, window and gazed upon the beautiful Bathsheba. The latter half of David's reign was greatly marred by the sin that followed, but it happened so quickly. In three tense verses in 2 Samuel, we read that he saw and he sent and he took. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. What a sudden fall that he had. But in reality, the corruptions of pride and lust had crept in unchallenged into David's heart long before, and they were just waiting for an opportunity to strike. Peter's denial warns us of the very same. No wonder the wise writer of Proverbs tells us, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. In this study of John's gospel, we've come to expect 
some silliness, some folly and sin from Peter, this lovable fisherman. But one sin we might not have expected was that of denying the Lord. What could have caused this true-hearted man to fail Jesus so badly? Well, the first answer, I think, was Peter's ignorance, which resulted in part from his tendency to speak while he should be instead listening to what Jesus was saying. Think about what Peter said to Jesus here in the very shadow of the cross. Lord, why can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. This statement shows an astonishing ignorance of what lay before the Lord in spite of his repeated explanations. How often had the Lord spoken of the necessity of the coming of his death? Earlier that very week, in John chapter 12 and verse 32, Jesus had spoken of being lifted up from the earth, thus telling his disciples what death he should die. This was added to numerous occasions when Jesus had plainly told them what must soon happen. In Luke chapter 18, verses 31 through 33, then he took unto him the twelve and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the Son of Man shall be accomplished. For he shall be delivered unto the Gentiles, and shall be mocked, and spitefully entreated, and spitted on. And they shall scourge him, and put him to death, and the third day he shall rise again. Peter heard all that stuff. And yet he didn't pay attention. That very evening, Jesus had instituted the Lord's Supper, during which he passed the cup. And he said, this cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. It, it, if it discouraged us to see how little of Jesus' teaching his disciples were able to understand and apply, then we should realize how difficult it is for men and women to believe the truths that contradict their own perceived eyes. Seeing Jesus' frustration with his students should drive every preacher and teacher on his knees to pray, Dear Lord, help them to understand. Help them to listen, unlike what Peter was doing here. Given all that he had taught about his coming death, we can imagine some irony in Jesus' voice when he said to Peter, Will thou lay down thy life for my sake? <laughs> no, Peter, no, it isn't going to be that way. It isn't Peter who's going to lay down his life for Jesus, but Jesus is going to lay down his life for Peter. Even when it came down to obligations for all the disciples to follow Jesus and carry their crosses, Peter's betrayal, his ignorance, is, 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 is often the true cost of being, he betrays his ignorance and, and seeing the true cross of being a Christian. Therefore, when crunch time came, he was not ready to die. He ran away with the others and went further by denying his Lord. Peter wasn't ignorant of what Jesus was about to do. He was also showed his astonishing ignorance of himself. He certainly did not calculate the truth of his weakness when he faced a real challenge. He simply didn't recognize the infirmity of his corrupt nature. Arthur Pink wrote, Peter knew and really loved the Lord, but how little he as yet knew himself. When Jesus told him, whether I go, thou canst not follow me now, in verse 36, Peter should have recognized how ill-prepared he was not simply for what Jesus was called to do, but also for the far lesser deeds that Peter himself was called to do. This ignorance of our spiritual weakness is not restricted just to Peter. Christians often think that they can toy and dabble with forbidden pleasures and then are distressed when they become overwhelmed and involve themselves in some kind of moral catastrophe. Peter's duty that evening was simply to admit before the world that he was a follower to, of Christ. How far beyond our cowardly flesh is even the best of us? 
J.C. Ryle wrote this, we never know how far we might fall if we're tempted. We fancy sometimes, like Peter, that there are some things we could not possibly do. We look pitifully upon others who fall into certain sins and please ourselves in the thought that at any rate we should not have done so. We know nothing at all. The seeds of every sin are latent in our hearts, even when renewed, and they only need occasions or carelessness or withdrawal of God's grace for a season to put forth an abundant crop. Those are very wise words that we need to take to heart. The, the way for biblically informed Christians to avoid falling into devastating sins is for us to realize how capable we are of doing such things. Being properly informed about ourselves, we will then shun temptations. We will starve these sinful desires and we will daily pray as Jesus taught us to pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. There's a second contributing factor to Peter's quote unquote sudden fall. It was overconfidence. This was, I think, in part, part of the ignorance, but it was also simply an aspect of his own sin and folly. Luke's gospel tells us that this episode took place right after the disciples had been arguing amongst themselves over which one is the greatest. And Mark tells us that Peter not only claimed that he would die for Jesus, but he also emphasized how much more faithful he would be than all the others. But Peter said unto him, Although all shall be offended, yet will not I. Peter thus set himself up as an example of the famous Proverbs, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before the fall. Jesus' rebuke thus had the intention of humbling Peter. His pride was a threat not only for the dark night to come, but even more importantly for his future ministry as an apostle. Peter thought the Lord needed him. What he had to really learn was how much he needed the Lord. A humbling failure would then be the best teacher of this vital lesson that Peter had to learn. Therefore Jesus told him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. I want to look at Peter's face when he said that. <laughs> me? I'm sure that's what he thought at that time. But in saying this, Jesus showed his sovereign foreknowledge of detailed events, including the number of Peter's denials and the immediate crowing of the rooster, so that this accurate prophecy is another proof that Jesus is God. But Jesus also showed his wise handling of his servant. Jesus knew that Satan would think that Peter was very pompous and very self-confident. And Luke tells us that Jesus said, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Peter's utter weakness would be displayed in that Satan would overtake this fisherman, not at his weakest point, but at his strongest point, Peter's courage. We can see Peter was a courageous man. He was ready to die for Jesus in his own mind. It was imperative then for Peter to learn, as it is for all of us, that we are far too weak to withstand the sifting of Satan, even in our greatest strength. The sooner we know this, the sooner we'll become strong in the Lord so that he will uphold us even at the points of our greatest weaknesses. This is what Paul meant when he said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in mine infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Peter's once again, quote, sudden, unquote, fall into sin had a third component that builds on the previous two. Peter was ignorant of the Lord's saving work and of his own weakness, and thus he was overconfident and relying on his own strength. And the third cause of his fall was his neglect of spiritual resources. 
This mistake took place on this same evening when Jesus took Peter and some others to the Garden of Gethsemane for prayer. And before drawing away for his own period of the most intense pleading with the Father, Jesus advised his disciples three times, pray, pray, pray that ye enter not into temptation. But when the Lord returned from his own prayer time, he found Peter and the others not praying. You know this story, they were sleeping. Peter's was not the sleep of a, a falsely confident man who doesn't think, it, or Peter's was the sleep of a very falsely confident man who didn't think he needed God's help. And how true this is of uh, parents today who pray little for the Lord's help with their children, of pastors who pray little for God's power to build and protect their congregations. And in fact, all Christians who pray little, spend little time in God's word, and fail to be consistent in attending the worship services of their church. They think they don't need God. Such a neglect of spiritual resources show an intense ignorance an intense overconfidence when it comes to this grave matter of temptation to sin. John Calvin says, let us learn to distrust our own strength and betake ourselves early to the Lord that he may support us by his power. Just as we all need to be warned by the fall of Peter, we should also be uplifted by the fact that while Peter would fall, he would not be forsaken. Peter shows us that anyone can fall into temptation, even to denying the Lord. But Peter also proves that when a true believer falters, Jesus will nevertheless save him or her in the end. And so while this starts off as a very dreary thing, it ends up with a very positive thing. We can know that Peter was not forsaken by reading ahead in the story to when Jesus, after his resurrection, restores Peter to full apostleship. If you want to read ahead, you'll find that in John 21, verses 15 through 19. But we really don't need to look ahead because it was clear, even here, as Jesus predicted Peter's denials, that the fishermen would not be finally lost. And the reason that Peter was not lost pertain to every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that while we must be very vigilant lest we fall, we can yet have the peace of knowing that we will never be forsaken by Christ. We know that Peter will not ultimately be lost first because of the declaration that Jesus made concerning his salvation. Jesus said in verse 36, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. He's saying your salvation is guaranteed in those words there in verse 36. Uh, at this time, Peter might have only heard the first part of that statement, thou canst follow me now. But it's the second half that contained his salvation, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. We can read that statement, I think, in two ways, both of which are probably intended here. First, since Jesus was going ahead of his disciples into glory, he declared that Peter would follow him there himself. This is the theme that Jesus goes on into in the next verses that we'll be looking at next week, wanting to give assurance to all of his disciples. Here's a preview of what we'll be looking at next week in chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. Peter, all disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. So I'm sure this is what Jesus had in mind when he said, you're going to follow me there, Peter. In answer to Peter's questions, Jesus flatly declared this to him personally. Peter would follow Jesus into heaven. 
not only was Jesus headed to heaven, but he would first pass through his death on the cross. This is why Peter was being so presumptuous when he asked to follow the Lord and, and then glibly offered to die for him. But the time would come for Peter to follow his master to the cross in order to die. After Christ's resurrection and his restoration to service, Peter would follow Jesus in so many ways. Peter would declare Jesus' gospel to Jerusalem. He would perform miracles in Jesus' name. Peter would go on to share in the fellowship of the sufferings of the Lord. And according to church tradition, he would die on a cross during Nero's persecution there in Rome. At the end of John's gospel are words from Jesus that allude to Peter's future crucifixion. John chapter 121, verses 18 and 19. But now was not the time for Peter to face this test. In fact, an important step in Peter's preparation as an apostle, as an apostle was his failure on this very night, which would teach him so many things about himself and also teach him many things about the grace of the Lord. Just as Jesus made a declaration concerning Peter's salvation, he has done the same for every man, woman, and child who believes in him. Many of these statements are found in John's gospel that we've studied already. You remember what Jesus said back in John chapter 6, verses 39 through 40. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. No one's going to be lost if they're a true believer. Similarly, after teaching us that he is the good shepherd, Jesus said that his sheep will know him and follow his voice. We studied this in John 10, 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Whenever the fall of Judas and Peter is preached, many true Christians will start to worry about their own souls. Could I be a Judas? Could I be a, a, a Peter like that and deny Jesus? Just as you'll recall the disciples, when Jesus said one of them would betray them, each of them was asking, is it I? Could I be the one to betray him? And Christians feel that way. None of us, I think, are satisfied with ourselves as Christians. None of us get to the point where we, I'm kind of arrived. I'm a good Christian now. None of us get there, and so we worry about such things, you know, and, and we see that people like Peter, people like Judas could fall and, and betray the Lord. Could, could I be one? Could I be lost? The way to answer this question is to determine whether you are a Judas or a Peter now. That's what we have to think about. And the key difference is that Judas never believed in Jesus, whether he ought we profess faith or not. Whereas Peter was a genuine believer in Christ, even in the midst of all his failings. Despite all of your own failings, and you and I will have many, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, he has declared your salvation just as he declared Peter would follow him into heaven. And no one's going to pluck you out of his hand. Second, Luke's gospel adds an important detail that will be helpful to include here. Jesus' prayer for Peter's repentance and restoration. Going back to the gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. Satan might be able to overcome Peter's courage, but he could never, ever, ever defeat 
Jesus' prayer. We too, as believers in Christ, are shielded by this same priestly intercession as Jesus prays for us in heaven from his throne at the right hand of God. He's praying for you now, and he's praying for me now, as he prayed for Peter. While Peter, in his foolish self-confidence, would fail to pray on this dreadful night, Jesus would remember to pray not only for himself, but all of his sifted disciples. Paul applies this to us in Romans 8, 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. You're going to fail. I'm going to fail. We're going to do some things that we thought we were even incapable of doing. But if we're Peter, he's praying for us. Satan may get to us, but he can't have us because the Lord's praying for us. Jesus has a ministry for every believer that continues even now, safeguarding in heavenly prayer those who he purchased with his own blood here on earth. The third thing I want to point out is that Jesus is warning to Peter, including a provision that was intended to provoke repentance. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. Later that very night, when Peter had denied Jesus for the th third time, while he yet spake, the cock crew. Luke twenty two sixty says. And at that moment, Jesus turned and he looked at his disciple. You can picture it in your mind. In the darkness, he's looking at Peter. Peter's looking at him. Their eyes met. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And what happened to Peter? Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter did, Jesus did that whole thing about the rooster crowing so that Peter would remember and that would lead to his repentance. I don't know how you or I or any Christian might fail the Lord even doing something so dreadful as to deny him before the world. But I do know this, that if we do, and if we have sincerely believed in Jesus, despite our failure, Jesus has already made provision for our repentance and restoration, just as he did for Simon Peter. And what a hope this is for all of us. What a hope this gives to parents to spouses and friends of those who, who once professed faith in Jesus and gave credible evidence of that faith, but have since fallen away. We all know people like that. None of us is able to read anyone's heart but our own. And even that is, is questionable sometimes because our hearts are deceitful. Just as the disciples were fooled by Judas we could easily have been fooled by others' false professions of faith. But we know that those who truly belong to Christ will never be lost and that he has made provision for the repentance of his most wayward sheep. And that's a good thought to hold on to. Remember that Peter fell in part because he confused roles with Jesus. Peter was never meant to die for Jesus. Jesus was never meant to be the Savior, only a witness to the Savior, Jesus Christ. Overconfident in himself, Peter then did not rely on the Lord, nor did he avail himself of the privilege of prayer. And his experience proves to us that we are never the Savior, but always those who are saved. Knowing that Jesus will be faithful to us, no matter how wayward we might stray or how sadly we might fall, we have the privilege of doing the very thing that Peter failed to do. We are to be witnesses for Jesus in the world. It is our privilege to be asked 
what Peter was asked. You're one of his disciples, aren't you? Somebody at school, one of a person at work might say that. And we should answer, yes, I am. Yes, I am. And then tell all who will hear about the grace and the glory of Jesus Christ. That was what Peter should have done on that night and what he came to do later on. We're called to do the same thing. If we will overcome our ignorance with the teaching of God's word, if we humble ourselves with constant reliance on the Lord's grace, and if we make diligent use of prayer and other spiritual resources that we have, we can be confident even in our weaknesses that we will not deny our Lord. We're not going to make the same mistakes Peter did. He made those mistakes for our learning so that we might follow in his footsteps. Can't be overconfident. We can't be ignorant. We have to avail ourselves of spiritual resources. In this way, not simply before the rooster crows, but before the trumpet sounds to call all mankind to appear before the Lord Jesus Christ in his glory, we can then be used by many to tell of Jesus and his salvation. And what is his salvation? What is the gospel? What is this good news that Jesus came to deliver? He came to deliver bad news first. God's holy. And you're not. <laughs> well, I kind of, I'm not that bad. This is how people think. They compare themselves to other people. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a Hitler. I'm not a, a Jeffrey Dahmer. I'm not a serial killer. You know, I'm not that bad. But Jesus' standard is the standard that God set before him and all of us. You must be holy as I am holy. You must be perfect. That means that you never sinned in thought, word, and deed your entire life. You have kept every one of God's laws perfectly, without exception. Not one time did you lie. Not one time did you take something that didn't belong to you. Not one time did you lust after something or covet something in your entire life. In the new members class, I speak of myself, and I always say, if every one of my sins was a shovel full of dirt, I have heaped up over my lifetime a mountain of sin. I am not holy. I am not holy. God is. And not, God is so holy, he can't let unholy people into his presence. He can't do that, or he would cease to be God. He can't taint himself like that. So that's the bad news. How do unholy people like us ever get to heaven? The good news is God in consultation with the Trinity, developed a plan of salvation whereby sinners like us could enter into his presence. And yet God still had to remain just and holy. The law had to be kept. Sin had to be punished. And the Trinity determined that sin would be punished on Jesus in our stead. And that his perfect righteousness in keeping the law perfectly in thought, word, and deed would be given to us. The theologians call this double imputation. Our sin is imputed to him, and he pays for it entirely. Our sin is gone as far as the east is from the west, and his righteousness is given us. We are clothed in his righteousness. That's the way salvation takes place, but it must be received. It must be believed in simple childlike faith. That's the hard part, hard, hard part for most people. They, 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 the, the childlike faith part. How, how, how does that work? How does a guy die on a cross 2,000 years ago affect me now? But Jesus and God in their grace gives us faith. And we in simple childlike faith say, I may not understand it, but I believe it. Jesus died in my place. And he gives me his righteousness. And I trust that's how I'm going to get to heaven. And if anybody asks me, how are you going to get into heaven? I'm not going to say because I did this, that, or the other thing. I'm going to say because of what Jesus did. He did it all. All to him I owe, as the song sings. That's the simple gospel message. You heard it. You have a responsibility. Repent and believe it. And we pray that if you're a lost person, you will repent 
and believe the gospel today before it's too late. It'll be too late when you die. It'll be too late when the Lord comes back. Even so, Lord Jesus, come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the message that Peter has given us, the message that John has given us through the word. We thank you that Jesus is now even interceding. And we pray that he's praying for one lost sinner to repent and believe and giving him that faith to repent and believe. And for all of us believers, we pray that we have been heartened and lifted up by the good news that in spite of all of our faults and failures, and we have so many, even as believers, we continue to sin, but we confess our sins and knowing that you're faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we daily come to you for that forgiveness. And we know that you're praying for us. And we know that when you're, we're, we're in your hands and we'll never be lost. And we thank you for that great biblical truth. And so we worship you. We bow down before you, thanking you and praising you for so great a salvation, which you have made us partakers in through the blood of Jesus Christ. And we ask you now that you would take the preaching of the word, this foolishness of preaching as it's called in your word, and use it. Build up your saints, encourage them, lift them up, challenge them. And if there are any lost people, save them. Save your people, we pray. In Christ's name, amen.